Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all doing well today. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an educator at the Museum of Science and part of this Wicked Hot Mystic team. So we're so excited to be here today to share a little bit about the second tool we are using in data collection this summer. Um, so it's a little bit of a uh, recap see if I can get this going. Great. Uh, so what is Wicked Hot Mystic? This summer, the Museum of Science is teaming up with the Mystic River Watershed Association to uh, do some heat and air quality mapping throughout the whole watershed. This is exciting because previously the museum teamed up with the cities of Boston and Cambridge and the town of uh, Brookline to do some heat mapping further south. So we are trying to expand further and further away from the city center and get some really good data to share around with planners and um, anybody who can help us make some positive changes. So our goals for this summer are community engagement, some amazing high resolution temperature data, um, and also data visualization and communication. So we're going to layer these maps with all of these um, temperature data with different sorts of data, like who is living in certain areas or other, other factors in the areas like tree canopy or maybe some water features like ponds or even fountains. Um, and with all of that, we can take a look at some extreme hot spots in the watershed and also compare them to the maps that we have made previously a little bit further south. What we are really trying to get to are mapping urban heat islands. So the urban heat island effect uh, takes into account that things that you find in urban centers, maybe not as many ponds and lakes, but things like pavement, um, people in general, the cars that we have in close quarters, the air conditioners that we run in close quarters, these actually contribute to making the environment in urban centers hotter. So we're hypothesizing that we'll see a pretty big difference between urban centers and more rural or suburban settings, but we really want to see that with the data that we're collecting this summer. So a little bit about us, I already introduced myself. My name is Katie. My colleague, Sarah, is also on the call today. Hi, Sarah, thank you so much. <laughs> She'll be helping out and answering your questions in the chat because I cannot see them. Um, and we are both from the Museum of Science, but as I mentioned, we're partnering with the Mystic River Watershed Association. We're also partnering with a whole bunch of other groups in the uh, Mystic River watershed. We are talking with Green Roots for working with the Resilient Mystic Collaborative, and of course, all of the towns and cities within the watershed itself. Uh, so we're very excited to be campaign organizers this summer. You're gonna hear that term a little bit later, so I wanted to make sure that we introduced ourselves as such. Um, and as I mentioned, we're collecting the air temperature and the humidity and air quality data in the watershed this summer. You may have seen heat maps of the area before, uh, but what we're doing this summer is a little bit different because of who we are partnering with. And I think that's my next slide. We are partnering with Kappa Strategies and their Heat Watch program. Uh, Kappa Strategies, they developed a really cool sensor, which is, is pretty new, at least to us. And this sensor actually hooks onto typically a car and it measures the air temperature six feet up, which is almost the temperature that we are experiencing as we are walking around. So a lot of times, if you have seen heat maps, they are using technology that looks down on an area and maps the surface temperature. So you can imagine the sand at the beach is a lot hotter than maybe a grassy field. And this technology takes it a step further to actually measure the temperature of the air that humans are breathing. And this summer, we as a team want to take it a step further by doing uh, air quality measuring as well. So we're gonna get to that a little bit later. Um, Kappa Strategies this summer, they have recruited a whole cohort of museums from around the nation. They're mostly museums, um, but institutions that are, are serving as campaign organizers in different cities around the nation. And they are supporting 
institutions like us who are recruiting and supporting volunteers, hopefully like you, if you like what you learned today in helping us generate these maps throughout the summer. Kappa has very nicely actually made a training video on a little bit more about what they have created and how to use it. So Sarah and I thought it would be best just to let them speak in their own words about what you will be doing this summer if you are able to volunteer with us. There are a couple of differences that I'll highlight at the end of this video. Mostly, I want to say this video implies that you're going to be volunteering with us for an entire day. We would love that if you have the time, but we are also open to people volunteering for maybe about two hours at a time. So if you know you can't commit a full day, please stick with us till the end of this presentation um, because we're going to talk about different opportunities for, for different tasks. So now I'm going to let Kappa take it away with their video. And Sarah, please let me know that the audio is, is working because that would just be our luck that we test it and it's fine. Set, let's next get into the details of the campaign and the important roles you'll play in helping to identify how I think the audio just stopped, Gee. See, just our luck. We can test it as many times as possible. <laughs> it was working. <laughs> With the context set, let's next get into the details of the campaign and the important roles you'll play in how it seems to stop at that point. Um <laughs> helping to identify hotter and cooler spots across your region. Step 1. Prepare. The step you're now beginning as part of this training is prepare. Here, you'll learn about the polygons and routes. In order to map heat across an entire region, your campaign's overall study area has been split into multiple sub-areas, or polygons, as we'll refer to them. Each of these polygons contains a diverse set of land covers, such as parks, commercial centers, residential developments, and schools. Because the particular land cover at a location strongly influences the amount of heat that is felt there, collecting many data points across a variety of land covers will help inform the predictions of heat across the full study area. In data lingo, this way of selectively collecting data is called sampling and means that we don't need to gather information from every square inch of the polygon in order to make predictions about temperature and humidity across the entire area. You will be sampling the set of land covers in your polygon by transporting data collection equipment along pre-planned routes or traverses over three individual hours throughout the day. To help in this task, you may serve as a driver, navigator, or bicyclist. If driving, you'll be paired into teams of two people one driver and one navigator. Navigators will help the driver travel safely by directing turn-by-turn -turn directions along the route. Drivers and navigators are welcome to switch roles between morning, afternoon, and evening routes. Bicyclists, on the other hand, are asked to memorize their route ahead of time or plan stops to check their map, as navigating and bicycling at the same time is advised against for the sake of safety. Bicyclists are also asked to take special care of their health as they'll be outside exercising in hot weather. More on that later. Across all these volunteer roles is the responsibility to be safe and adaptive while traversing your routes. For an assortment of reasons, you may need to stray from your plan while driving or bicycling. We will discuss how to handle these adjustments later, though want to emphasize the importance of being flexible when needed throughout the campaign. Whether driving, navigating, or bicycling, your campaign organizer will reach out to you after this training to assign polygons and driving routes, as well as to coordinate teams of drivers and navigators. If you have the extra time, you might practice driving or bicycling your route prior to campaign day to familiarize yourself with the turns and traffic patterns. After this training, you'll also need to sign the Heat Watch Volunteer Waiver in order to participate. Step 2. Activate. 
In this step, your organizer will confirm the date of the campaign and coordinate when and where you can pick up your equipment. As your tentative campaign date approaches, your organizer will be paying close attention to the weather forecast and keeping an eye out for the ideal high heat, clear skies day. Once this is determined, they'll send out an email confirming the date or advising backup plans, as well as advising a time and location for you to pick up your equipment. Your equipment package will consist of several items. Your data collection unit, a charging cable, a wall adapter, and a car adapter. Because our process relies on reuse, all of these materials are required to be returned to your organizer in a timely fashion after completion of your campaign. The package also contains a bumper magnet to be affixed to your rear bumper, letting other drivers know that you are on an important mission for science. If you plan to keep thinking like a climate researcher, you are welcome to keep the bumper magnet as a token of our appreciation. Otherwise, please return the magnet to your organizer along with the rest of your equipment after the campaign. Now we'll learn about how to install and operate your data collection equipment. The equipment is made up of a temperature and humidity sensor attached to a neck that houses the data transfer wires and the body containing the battery and data storage. The equipment should be assembled, sterilized, and charged when you pick it up. Once you've arrived at the beginning of your route and are parked in a safe spot, turn on the sensor and wait for the blinking green light to turn solid. This is how you know if the GPS is tracking. If it takes more than 10 minutes, move to another location and try again. With the sensor set, roll down your passenger side window, fit the window into the slot of the device, and roll up the window until the device feels stable and secure. Keep your window rolled up for the duration of your route. A blinking red light indicates 30 minutes of battery life remaining. And a solid light indicates 5 minutes remaining. If your sensor needs charging, simply plug it into the car charger provided. Step 3. Execute. It's campaign day. On the designated campaign day, you'll be driving with the equipment along your same route three times, typically 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., and 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. These times are generally seen to exhibit the most consistent weather of all daylight hours. Here is the general schedule for campaign day. At least 15 minutes prior to the first traverse, arrive to the starting point of your route, Park in a safe location and turn on and install your data collection equipment. At the top of the hour, begin to follow your route. Our software will later remove any data collected before the start of the hour, so there's no advantage to getting a head start. In order for equipment to make the most accurate measurements, vehicles should be moving under 35 miles per hour. All driving routes are designed to avoid highways and fast moving roads. But if you find yourself on a road with a higher speed limit than 35 miles an hour, you may try driving in the right lane or turning on your hazard lights to indicate you are intentionally moving slowly. Driving safely is the most important, so if you need to move with the flow of traffic, please do so. Conversely, if you hit traffic and slow down, that's okay too. Also, look for and be sure to avoid low-hanging tree branches, or other obstacles that might catch or knock the equipment from its position. Remember to never roll down the window while moving. It may be tempting for the navigator to take a picture out the window, but equipment can easily fall and be damaged if not secured properly at moving speeds. If you find a part of your route is blocked or has a designated detour, do your best to get back on track when you can, and follow the same path in your remaining routes. Again, your safety is most important, and more likely than not, you will be collecting usable data that will sufficiently describe your polygon's temperature distribution. If you finish the planned route early, you can continue to drive within your polygon until the end of the hour, though do try to avoid repeating parts of your route or crossing over locations you've already visited. If there is the unlikely event of rainfall or any form of precipitation during your traverse, you should immediately pull over and bring the equipment inside the vehicle or inside a bag if you are on a bicycle. 
If bicycling, be sure to monitor and take care of your health by drinking plenty of water, wearing sunscreen, and stopping to rest as needed. A full list of health considerations for bicyclists is available in your electronic volunteer folder. At the end of the hour, pull over at a safe location and uninstall the equipment. Once you're fully stopped, remove the device and store it in a cool, dry place, and plug into a charger if necessary. The equipment's battery life is roughly 10 hours on a single charge, and needs just one hour of charging to be fully restored. Repeat the above process for the afternoon and evening traverses in the same manner. After the last traverse, or on the following day, please return all equipment at the time and location designated by your organizer. Again, you are welcome to keep the bumper magnet if you would like to. If anything unexpected occurs during your traverse, like issues with the equipment, mishaps with the timing of your traverse, or rain, please be sure to convey these notes to your local organizer, who will provide a report to the data analysts. For any issues on the day of your campaign regarding equipment, technical issues, scheduling, or logistics, reach out to your campaign organizer directly by phone. Way to go! You've just served as an integral part in better understanding and preparing against extreme heat in your city. Step 4. Follow-up. The last step in your rule is to engage with the results of your campaign. After your equipment is received, CAPA will begin analyzing the many tens or even hundreds of thousands of measurements collected by campaign volunteers. They will produce traverse point maps for each of the three campaign hours, such as these, showing the hotter and cooler points along your route amongst the other routes driven by your fellow volunteers. Analysts will also create area-wide predictive surface models for each of the three campaign hours, as seen here. CAPA will share the results and summary of the campaign directly with your organizer, who will then plan the release of results to media outlets and the volunteer team, typically six to eight weeks following the day of the campaign. Taking a look at the maps of your traverse points and the predictive area-wide surfaces, you might consider, did the places I expected to be particularly hot show up as so? Were cooler spots as expected? What surprises did you see? And do you have any guesses as to why they might appear as warmer or cooler? Jot down your answers to these questions to share with your team. Once you've had the time to review the outputs and reflect, please take a few minutes to share your experiences, what you learned, and suggest ways for us to improve the Heat Watch program with us in our feedback survey. You are also encouraged to take photos throughout the campaign and share your Heat Watch experience on social media. You can engage with the Kappa team by tagging the program's Instagram or tweet us. If you're not on social media, you can upload photos directly to the electronic photos folder. We love to hear about your experiences, from your initial expectations of how heat is distributed in your city, to action shots during data collection, to reactions of seeing the results used in building resilience and climate adaptation. You can also use social media to keep track of Heat Watch programs and results in other cities around the U.S. and world. As you're considering ways to use the information, the organizing team will be working with the CAPA team to further explore the data and implement the information into resilience efforts. Stay tuned for the opportunity to participate in future campaigns in your area, as your city team may be interested in tracking trends in heat over time. Here are your next steps as a campaign volunteer. These can also be found in your electronic folder. Complete the knowledge check found in the volunteer folder. This should only take five to 10 minutes maximum. Sign the electronic volunteer waiver. Your organizer will contact you to assign your polygon and driving route. Practice driving your route and review campaign materials, including re-watching this video as needed and reviewing volunteer facts. Pick up or receive your equipment at the time and location to be designated by your organizer. Confirm your availability once your campaign day is confirmed by your organizer. 
Arrive to starting point 15 minutes prior to your morning route on campaign day and return 15 minutes before your afternoon and evening routes as well. Turn on and install your data collection equipment, waiting for a solid green light. Don't roll your window up or down until you've safely parked at the end of your hour. Drive or bicycle the same route at three designated times throughout the day. Return all equipment to the organizer and report any incidences. Participate in follow-up activities, like posting on social media and following future campaigns. If you have any additional questions, please reach out to your organizer through the contact information they've provided. Thank you so much for spending the time to learn about your important role as a volunteer data collector on this campaign. We couldn't do this without you. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so this was Kappa's overview of how they run their campaigns in the summer. Uh, we're going to get a little more specific on what we're doing in the watershed as a team this summer. Some of that might be a little bit different, so uh, bear with me. It's all pretty minor. Um, we are lucky enough this summer to be getting 20 sensors to map the watershed, which is really exciting for us. Often, Kappa might only use about eight sensors um, for this this area that we are doing, but um, we're going to get really specific data and start forming really close relationships with all of you by having more sensors. So this means that we have 20 polygons, uh, which I think Kappa mentioned in their video there, and that's just how we divide up the area that we are mapping. So you might hear us refer to polygons. In our case, it's pretty much the towns of the watershed, um, not exactly, but almost, uh, and each polygon has a route. So that route will be the same for the six o'clock run, the three o'clock run, and the seven o'clock run. Um, something that's different about our campaign is that we are also hoping to do a 6 a.m. run on the day after to see how uh, the night cooling things down actually works, if it works, where it works, and where it doesn't. Um, so we're really excited to try that out this summer. And this all might seem a little vague, and that's because, as you can tell, this campaign, this experience is really weather dependent. So we are hoping within the next month to have a heat wave. We're not often hoping for a heat wave in New England, but we are, um, which means we're going to have a couple days of weather of a temperature that is over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And ideally, we will run our campaign on the second or third day. So things in the area have really started to heat up and we can track that. Uh, and this is where we need your help. So because we have 20 sensors, that means we need at least 40 volunteers. And uh, so we'll have two volunteers per sensor, but that means that every single person is doing every single route. And as we mentioned, uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we don't have that high expectations. We know that maybe you can do one day, not the other, or morning, but not evening. Um, so please send us uh, any information you have. We're gonna send out a form at the end. Um, send us any availability you have. And Sarah and I and our team members are going to be doing a giant Sudoku, uh, trying to fit people together to make sure this campaign happens. Um, while we need 40 people, we could have up to 160 people or more helping us make observations during this heat wave. So spread the word. Uh, we definitely need help. Uh, we are going to be doing a sensor pickup at a central location. It's probably not the Museum of Science. We're kind of not officially in the watershed. We're like on the very corner of it. So we're still working with our partners within the watershed to find a place that'll be easy for all of you to get to. Um, that might mean if we're having different volunteers for different runs that you're going to, you know, come pick up the sensor, drive the route, and then immediately come back and drop off the sensor for the next team to pick it up. So that's another little difference from the video that we might have. Um, another difference that we have is that this summer we are also partnering with a, a team to track particulate matter. So this is for air quality. Um, particulate 
Particle pollution, also called particulate matter or PM, is a complex mixture of extremely small particles and liquid droplets in the air. When breathed in, these particles can reach the deepest regions of the lungs. Exposure to particle pollution is linked to a variety of significant health problems. And this is from the EPA. So we are adding this onto our campaign this year so we can track uh, where particulate matter might be uh, highest, where it might be interfering with public health the most. And we are partnering with uh, air beams, by, or we're using the sensors, air beams, partnering with Habitat Map. Um, so this is another sensor that can be mobile. So we might have volunteers who are driving routes uh, actually carry an air beam with them, but they can also be at a fixed point where we can track things changing over time. We haven't actually gotten the sensors yet, uh, so we were going to do a little training on them today, but we'll we'll do another training later to loop you all in on it. Um, we don't have an exact um, method of data collection yet because we wanna do everything. Um, so we're going to narrow that down um, over the next couple of weeks once we get the actual sensors in. But ultimately, um, if you're using one of these sensors, data syncs with um, an app on our phones and then it will all go to the Habitat Map team. And we're also sharing it with the Kappa team and our own team so we can integrate all of this data together with the heat mapping data. And I have a couple more slides. Um, so in the video, they mentioned sharing back with the campaign organizers, us, and also with the Kappa team by using social media or posting pictures to a Google Drive. Um, and we actually have yet another lovely partner, um, and they are IC Change. If y'all have tuned in with us before, you might have seen Sarah's IC Change training that she helped coordinate a couple of weeks ago. We refer to IC Change as Mother Nature's Instagram. Um, so it's an amazing place to go and post pictures, making observations about the world around you. And in many cases, the changing world around you. Um, so we have, these are examples from a few summers ago when we were heat mapping some of our volunteers who went on to IC Change and posted what they did to keep cool, places that they went to keep cool if it's not their home, what their cat does to keep cool, which is always one of our favorites. Um, and also really important places in your, your home, in your community that are not cool. We wanna know about those places that may affect where we map this summer and it may affect where we are able to place sensors throughout the summer, sorry, air beam sensors so that we can track air quality in these particularly hot places. Um, so I know I used to take buses everywhere from my old neighborhood and those bus stops were just extremely hot um, and we want to go back and measure, those are in the Mystic River watershed, we want to go back and measure how that might be affecting people who don't have access to a car. Um, so the IC Change app is really helpful for that. They also just have a website. If you're not using a mobile phone, you can access their website and make posts there. And we are getting all of those posts that relate to heat in the Mystic River watershed. So we're excited to communicate with you there. And we're hoping to use that to inform our campaign. Um, and as I mentioned, Sarah, I think is sticking a link in the chat to the training that she has already done on IC Change. So you can learn more about that project there. And that is it for our presentation. Um, we have a whole lot more information to share with you, but we wanted to start with, I think I'm missing a slide, but Sarah also has a link to the volunteer, basically sign up form that she'll stick in the chat. Um, and we really wanna hear from you. We, the form asks for a lot of information, nothing set in stone. We're asking for a lot of information like, when you know you won't be available this summer so that we don't email you on those days. We're just trying to give you a break. But if you don't know all that information now, it is definitely fine. We still wanna hear from you. We still wanna be in touch with you as the summer goes on and we start planning. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Sarah, are there any questions in the chat that we can address live? There are no questions in the chat yet, but feel free to type any questions you have in there or use the Q&A button. 
Um, one thing I did put in the chat is, as Katie mentioned, we are still working out our finalized method for the air quality sensors, um, but we will be getting them soon. And we will also be getting some new sensors that will, um, you don't actually have to connect them to your phone. Um, so this is a little easier way to uh, get the data and not have to connect it automatically to a phone, which in the past was an Android, which I know can be difficult for some people, though not Katie. <laughs> um, so, oh, we do have one question. Uh, remote data collectors. Um, so for the question is, I saw something about remote data collectors. Is that just for IC change? Um, for remote data collection, it's mostly IC change. It is a global platform, so you can use it anywhere uh, in the world. Um, but for the heat mapping itself and air quality mapping, we will be doing a majority of that within the Mystic River watershed. We will be placing, I believe, a couple sensors outside the watershed, but still within Boston and Cambridge, I believe. Um, but IC change is free to use and you can use it anywhere at any time. I also missed one note uh, in my run through that we are actually getting two bicycle sensors this summer. Um, and that's that's a first for our team. So another thing we're excited to prototype with you all this summer. So that is in the form as well. If you are comfortable riding a bike, uh, potentially in and around traffic, um, those are in addition to the 20 sensors that I mentioned. So we'll be needing 20 cars at these times. And then we're going to work with our partners and the Kappa team to find the most appealing routes to use a bike sensor. So maybe places that cars can't get to, for example. Um, so if you are an avid cyclist, we would like to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, and as Katie just said in the video mentioned, um, you do have to go relatively fast on the bike and you do have to do this in uh, very hot weather. So it is more for the avid cyclist as Katie just mentioned. And um, we do have another question. Will, we, will there be written instructions for the overall data collection procedure? The answer is yes. Um, we have a ton of materials that we will send out um, it's really important. I know a lot of you may have come here from the expression of interest form, and we will probably still be emailing people through that, but that heat mapping volunteer form I just uh, put in the chat, it's really important to fill that out because that is how we're really going to understand who is available to actually heat map on the day. Um, once we have that information, we will uh, then send you many PDFs, probably too many PDFs of instructions and information on how to do all of this. Um, we'll probably also schedule one more training for everyone who um, is absolutely heat mapping to make you feel more comfortable on how to use the sensors. We have much more information to share. <laughs> we wanted to keep this a little streamlined to, to welcome you all. All right, see any more questions? Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I hope you all are able to go out and enjoy these 23 minutes that we're finishing early. <laughs> and what is a beautiful day, at least in my neighborhood in the Mystic. Uh, so I'm excited to get out there and make my own observations for the day. Thank you so much, Sarah, for jumping on and helping me answer questions. And uh, again, we hope to hear from all of you soon. So um, Sarah might be frozen, but I might just leave the presentation going for a minute so that you all can uh, head to that form that she put in the chat. Uh, I can even try and really make sure it is prominent. All right, so we hope to hear from you in that form. Um, I thank you again, as Sarah said, you may have come from a different form um, from the volunteer interest form, but this we're getting a little bit more information on scheduling and actually getting the heat mapping done. So thank you all so much and we hope to hear from you soon.